annual events that we're do we're doing today. Um, just to let you all know, we are recording this session as well. So if you choose to be on camera, you can. And if you would like to not be on camera, that's fine too. But this session is being recorded. So I just wanted to let everybody know. Again, welcome. Thank you for being here. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Asiya Ghazi. I am currently working in the Center for Global Partnerships and Learning with Dr. Gabriela Miramontes. And it is my pleasure to be here to start us off. Uh, what I would like to do first is to tell you all a little bit more about the center. And with that said, uh, welcome to Pepperdine University GSEPS, Center for Global Partnerships and Learning. Within our dynamic center, we provide a range of offerings, including presentation support. We have workshops, we have various certifications uh, that we offer, and we also have the Scholarships Without Borders journal. So if you are interested in submitting an article to be published in our journal, please contact uh, myself or you can contact Dr. Charletta Green, and I will make sure to put her email address in the chat. With that said, we also have our thought-provoking podcast called Elevating Voices of Leadership. So if you would like to hear our podcast, we do have uh, guests on on a weekly basis and we do upload our podcast. Uh, so we can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you hear podcasts. I would now like to spotlight Lily. So Lily, I want to introduce you. Lily Vasquez is going to be, did I pronounce your last name right? Because I, I, I know I don't always pronounce it correctly with my accent. It's okay. Vasquez is all good. That's awesome. Good. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to present my friend and colleague, Lily Vasquez. She is going to be the moderator tonight for our panel. And then we will go ahead and spotlight our panelists and have them introduce um, themselves as well. With that said, Lily, let me talk a little bit more about Lily because she's awesome. Lily Vasquez is a first gen Latina who grew up and currently resides in occupied Tongva land. Her roots lie in Mexico and El Salvador, which she keeps close to heart. She received her BA in sociology with a minor in Latinx Latin American studies from Occidental College. While at Oxy, Lily conducted research alongside Dr. Jacqueline Rodriguez, focusing on the impact of social justice pedagogy on student experiences in and outside of the classroom. Her other research has focused on the ethnic social socialization and identity formation in second generation Salvadoran Americans. Previously, she was working in different student service roles within the field of higher education with a passion to building intercultural networks of knowledge and resources for BIPOC students and community members. She currently serves as the program administrator for Aliento, the Center for Latinx Communities here at Pepperdine University. Her experiences in the classroom and with students have deeply impacted her and cemented her dedication to supporting the lives of those in her community. On her days off, you can find Lily tending to her houseplants or outside garden, attending community-based art events and enjoying the music and culinary scene of Los Angeles. That means you and I need to hang out soon and go to some fun restaurants. <laughs> With that said, I am pleased to introduce Lily to you and Lily will be moderating our panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gossi, that was great. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight. Thank you for the warm welcome and the introduction. Before I start, I, I would like to, I'll share a little bit about uh, Ariento and what we do here. Uh, so uh, Ariento, the Center for Latinx Communities here at Pepperdine, we've been um, ongoing for about 11 years now. And the center is dedicated to addressing the individual and communal mental health needs of Latinx communities. Ariento, the Spanish word signifying breath, uh, conveys the essence of the center. So the center's overall purpose is to dar aliento, uh, which translates to give support, encouragement, life to our community members. The center houses three interrelated components, uh, a Latinx mental health training program, which is our MACLP MFT program here at GSEP, a community outreach and education activities, and a research institute. Our uh, program is committed to training students to work uh, primarily with Latinx communities. The program uh, prepares students to integrate a community-based uh, systemic perspective in their conceptualization, conceptualization and theoretic approaches in working with underserved and unserved Latinx communities. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit um, about us. If you have any questions or wanna learn more about the center, please let me know uh, and happy, uh, happy to do so. I'd also like to start off with a, um, a land acknowledgement. 
Uh, so we acknowledge that Pepperdine University is built on the ancestral and the unceded territories of the Chumash, Tongva, and Akshaman peoples. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our First People nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources um, to our um, to our Indigenous students, staff, faculty, and community members. As we may have folks come, uh, joining in from different areas, I'd also like to encourage you all to learn more about the Indigenous lands that you uh, occupy and connect with local Indigenous leaders and groups. Um, so before we start off, I would like to hand it back to Dr. Ghazi just to review some community guidelines um, as we move into our panel session. You're muted. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for the unmute. Um, so uh, just a few guidelines for all of you to follow. So make sure that you're on mute. Uh, right now, our panelists will be speaking. If you have any questions that come up, feel free to put them in the chat and we will go ahead and address those questions. Um, we will have a question and answer session after the panel as well. And at that time, you can always unmute and ask questions as well. Um, I would definitely suggest that you use the raise hand as thing on Zoom, uh, the raise hand feature on Zoom, and in that way, we'll know if you have a question and we'll go ahead and, um, you know, have you uh, come up and speak. Um, so for now, go ahead and put yourself on mute. Um, if something happens and you lose your internet connection and you want to get back on Zoom, we'll let you back in. So there's no problem with that. And uh, again, any comments, anything of that nature, go ahead and put it in the chat. And we look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Ghazi. Um, again, I'm honored to facilitate tonight's panel and learn from our incredible panelists. I'm excited to hear from each of you and create a space of learning with everyone present. Uh, so uh, I'd like to start off with introductions and I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. We can do a cold call or if someone would like to volunteer, that would also be great. Uh, but yeah, would anyone like to go first? Sure, I can start. Um... My name is Oscar Navarro. I am a third year EDD in learning technology student, I'm completing my dissertation this year through the EIP program. I'm the assistant head of middle school and the director of innovation for a six through 12 all girls school in West LA, Notre Dame Academy. Um, and my family is rooted on uh, Mexican on my dad's side and Guatemalan on my mom's side. Well, thank you, Oscar. Anyone would like to go next? I'll go next. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for coming and for sharing space. My name is Ana Guzman. Um, I am full Salvadorian, first generation. I am second year um, EDD learning technologies at Pepperdine. I uh, currently teach at Pasadena City College and at CSUN. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. I uh, would like to go up next. I'll go next. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. James Oliva. I'm a graduate of the Global Leadership Program at Pepperdine. I'm a senior manager at Amazon doing global corporate security. My family is from Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, or Guadalajara, Jalisco, to be more accurate. And we were sugarcane farmers that immigrated uh, back in the 80s. And I'm first generation Mexican here, born in California. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Oliva. Um, who'd like to go next? I can go next. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to share some space here with you all. Um, I did uh, recently graduate from the Aliento program that Lily was highlighting earlier. Um, so I was able to um, train and working um, with our communities um, in regards to mental health and some of the barriers that show up. I am currently transitioning into uh, what my role after school is going to look like. I work in social services currently. Um, I'm still connected with um, Pepperdine and the Aliento Center. I am the co-founder of Aliento Community Organization, which is a student um, psych a psychology student group um, that helps students that identify as Latinx just um, address barriers, challenges that come up through um, their time in academia. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and just share some space with you all. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, who do we have left? All righty, I'll go next. Hi, everybody. Greetings from Texas. My name is Manny Saldivar. I am a fifth year senior in the EDD program, uh, working in my uh, organizational leadership program is what I'm in. So I'm working on my dissertation and I work for Texas Christian University as a college advisor. 
I work in the local high schools helping underserved students uh, get the guidance to figure out their pathway. Awesome, and I think we have Alejandra. Yes, hi everyone. Nice to see you all here. I'm Alejandra Jimenez. Uh, my dad is from Michoacan, Mexico. My mom's side is Mexican American. They're born here in the US. So technically, I guess I'm second generation. I'm a fourth year PhD student right now. So just wrapping up the dissertation. I uh, used to work at Pepperdine for a few years. My last role, I really got to help Latinx students who were pursuing their MBA degree. And right now I work in uh, sports sales. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We have a great uh, you know, group of panelists here tonight. And like I said, I'm excited uh, to learn from a, a each of you. Uh, we'll move on into our second question. And we touched upon this a little bit during introductions, but um, we'll follow as what communities are you rooted in and how does your cultural and ethnic identity inform the work that you do? And if you need me to repeat the question at any time, please let me know. Anyone can jump in. I know it's a bigger question, um, so it may take some some time to think about, but feel free to jump in uh, whenever you'd like. Um, I'll go ahead and get it started. Um, so my communities are, uh, well, both my parents are Mexican, um, from Puebla and from Mexico City. Um, and so this informs a lot my work because I am more aware of a lot of challenges and barriers that can come across for folks and individuals, especially when they're pursuing higher education, um, whether, and even when it's not higher education, right? When it's any kind of resource. And so I always keep that in the forefront that um, although we might all be similar or not similar, there's always barriers. And so just keeping my culture, um, my history, my background, and even my own barriers in mind really informs the way I work um, and how I move forward with communities. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica, for starting us off. I think to piggyback off of Jessica too, so Mexican and Central American are my parent from uh, my parents' first gen was really a big thing because I think what it's informed me to do, especially with the students that I work with and the families that I work with, and I think several people in the panel or in the audience too can relate to having been the resource for everything for your own self when it came to college and that whole process and trying to be that gateway for the families that we have at my school site where they're also first-gen families trying to figure out how to best place their daughter. I think, Manny, you do something similar too um, with your communities as well. And I think in, in trying to do that, is there's a big empathy piece there because it, while it was not that long ago, it was a while ago, and also trying to keep up to date with how the college process has changed for my student population as well, and what it means to go to college in 2023, 2024, and what it means to be a person of color, and what it means to be first gen, and maybe speaking different languages than others do as well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Oscar. I'll go next. So I think, uh, so I was raised and I was born in Pico Union area. So I think being part of that community is very important for me because a lot of my students, I can relate to their experiences. I can relate to their families. Um, I'm teaching at Northridge and it's still like, even though it's far from Pico Union, it's still like, I can still relate to a lot of the experiences of first generation. I think we tend to forget that, so I was born here, but I was an English learner as well. So we tend to forget that um, dynamic as well. Sometimes we can be born here and still be English learners. Um, Spanish was, was my first language. Um, so um, I'm really big on bilingual education, multilingual education. Um, I'm part of CABE. Um, so I'm a big advocate uh, on that aspect of of education. Awesome, thank you, Anna. Alejandra, Manny. Uh, yeah. I go ahead, Alejandra. Thank you, thank you, Manny. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I'm born and raised in California, SoCal. I'm a SoCal girl. Um, recently, I moved to Colorado to pursue uh, the sports industry. It's always been a dream of mine. And when I moved here, I was like, Oh, wow, it's a lot of less diversity than what I was used to in California. And for me, it's been so important to keep the Spanish language going. Uh, like I said, half my family's from Mexico, half in the US. So 
They're totally different, uh, different cultures and traditions, uh, even though they're very related. Um, so here, uh, what really made me feel at home, because even the sports industry, only myself and one other person, uh, we work for four professional teams here. Uh, there's only like two of us that speak Spanish. Um, and we have a Spanish community here uh, that really needs Spanish speakers. Uh, something else that has really kept me rooted is um, my church community. So I found a church community here um, and it's really great. It has a lot of different international uh, people from all the way from Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, all over, um, and even English speakers too. So they have both there. Um, and then there's like a place that I found where people like to go dancing on the weekends. And I was like, I love that. It's all Spanish music there. Um, so just finding the communities here uh, has been very helpful with the church. So, a bunch of my parents come from Guadalajara, Jalisco. So, yes, James, we have Jalisco roots in us. Um, I am a first gen. I was born here in Texas and raised in Texas all my life. And so, grew up in a time in the early 90s where my neighborhood at first was predominantly white. And so, you know, a lot of times I was the the one to be translating for my parents all the time. So, I remember being four and going to the doctor and just that really just, I, I learned advocacy at a very young age just through that experience. And um, I think therein lies why I'm doing what I'm doing, just because I'm able to offer grace and empathy to these students and their families. And I just see time and time the relief when they're like, oh, hablas espanol, you speak Spanish, you know? And so I think that I just remember how growing up that was so impactful for me and how I'm able to now support these, these other students and their families. Oh, yeah, that's great, Manny. I, I really resonate with <laughs> having to be, you know, the translator for our family members, for our parents. Um, I feel like that's an experience that a lot of us share. Uh, Dr. Oliva? Yeah, thanks. For me, uh, I think that the main thing that I can think about is just always being the, that diverse, the diversity advocate in everything that I do. Uh, and that's what it informs me and reminds me who I am. And I'm very proud to be that. And I'm, I'm also I wasn't proud at the at the time, but I was my first language was Spanish and English was my second language. So at times my accent comes out and I have a hard time pronouncing certain words. And now now I own it and I'm very proud of that. And it allows me to be patient and compassionate and give empathy to others from globally from different races and different ethnicities. And I love to create that space for them um, because we all come from different places and it's beautiful. I think it, it takes a long time to understand that, that it is beautiful that we come from different places and that we are different people with different points of views, uh, different values. So for me, it's my job's always been to just be that advocate for it, whatever it is uh, that is different to, to help uh, and advocate for that. Wow, thank you. I, I really resonate with what you um, what you mentioned about how like bilingual, being bilingual and, and how that creates more empathy and grace with other um, folks who may be speaking other languages. I know um, being in LA, we have, you know, a lot of different folks here, a lot of different languages here. And so it it does, you know, when I think about it now, it does. I also enact the same as I'm moving in these different spaces. Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, our next question is, how did you learn about your own cultural history, your family history, um, or how did you learn about the history of the, uh, the Latino community here in the States? I'll go first. I think I have a funny one. Um, because I was so immersed in Mexican culture, I didn't really see anything else. So I learned about my culture when I started learning more about other people's culture. Because uh, for the mo for for the most part, all I knew was Mexican culture. So you know our music, our food, um, you know where we come from, our religion. I mean everything, right? Uh, I was just so ingrained in it that I didn't know anything different. So for me, my first like really multicultural experience was, you know, going to like the military. Uh, I served in the United States Marine Corps, and going there, that was my first time going anywhere else other than outside of the LA area. So it was really interesting to me. But I was able to see that there's different religions. I thought everybody was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got there, I saw there was multiple religions. I thought, um, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, music, you know, classic rock and some of these other things. And so then it, it sort of empowered me to embrace my culture more because I didn't see how special it was because I was just so in, in it. And then, you know, the music and I, you know, like we have such diverse food great music, you know, great, uh, just we're, we're great artists. And I sort of didn't value that because I was in it and raised in it and didn't know any difference. I didn't have anything to compare it to. So once I was able to compare it to, then I owned it more. 
and I was prouder to that. So to this day, even today, we were eating at a Mexican restaurant and I was, and I was bragging that Mexican food is the best. Uh, and that's because I have a little bit more uh, understanding of different cultures and different foods. And I was being a little biased there. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. <laughs> so to, to add on kind of that immersion, it's funny because I born and raised in LA, you can't escape the Mexican culture that's in every corner here in LA. So uh, that was definitely ingrained. And I just learned when um, my parents' families immigrated to, to the US, I had a lot of tias and tios here. So it was a lot of community that was already established. In fact, my parents met because their cousins were dating at the time, but that's another story. Um, but in that sense, I also know my mom like made a concerted effort for us to get to know Guatemala and would take us in different phases of our childhood and adulthood to go meet our families. Um, so that was always really nice. But it also helped me see the differences in the different Latin countries as well. And there was a form of code switching as well between the countries that I became very aware of when I was little, um, whether it was like I would never say vos in a in a in a Mexican uh, community that was very much a Central American thing that we would say. And if I wouldn't say it in the Central American, like it meant something else. So very keenly aware of kind of that type of different identity that each country and even regions within countries uh, and, and, and colonias within countries have um, in and of itself and the dialects and all of those pieces. Thanks for sharing. I really resonate. I, I remember that experience as a, as a younger as a younger girl too kind of hearing the switching between my mom and my parent and my dad's family as well. Anyone I'd like to go next? I'll go next. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say for me, it was stories since, you know, we didn't have other family here in Texas. My mom would through narrative or uh, family artifacts or, or photo albums were so popular and she'd be like, that's your great abuelo. And, you know, through a recipe book, right? And these were the, the gordita recipe. And so it was through stories that I just, at two or three, I'd be like, mom, tell me that story again, or tell me about that one time when you were a kid. And that really created that idea of, oh, I have this whole family, you know, back in Mexico. And those stories were very helpful to create that identity for me. Thank you, Manny. For me, I was born in Pico Union. So it's a very Central American type of area. Um, but then when I was maybe around six, they, uh, we, we moved to East LA, we, we moved to Boyle Heights. And so that's predominantly Mexican. And so for a really long time, I hid my Salvadorianness. I would, you know, speak like my Mexican friends. I would eat like my Mexican friends. I, we joke, even to this day, there's like some, some of my friends from my younger years, they're like, you were Salvadorian? I'm like, yeah, I was. So I was um, I was adopted as a Mexican uh, for a really long time, uh, but I had the privilege to go to El Salvador a lot. Um, unfortunately, my parents at that time couldn't go with me. They couldn't travel with me, so um, they make fun of me, but they actually sent me by myself in an airplane when I was four. So they would send me with my abuelita and with my family in El Salvador, and I learned a lot of about the culture there uh, through them. Um, but that was, that was crazy because I have kids of my own now and I'm like, I wouldn't send my four-year-old by himself, but you know, different times. It was the eighties. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Anna. Alejandra? Yes, I'd love to jump in. Um, growing up for me, I really feel was bilingual, bicultural, and there's like a lot of research on that. Uh, I'll share it after. There was a an Indian American woman. I believe she was born in India, raised here, and then she would go back home to India sometimes. And they would talk about her accent um, and vice versa. Um, and that's kind of funny. So growing up, I, I really enjoyed that. My dad's side was from Mexico. Like like you guys all mentioned, food. That's a big part of the culture. Uh, we know like the real thing, like real deal from home compared to when you go out. Um, but my American side of my family, I remember like. I was embarrassed growing up sometimes because I was like one of the only cousins who spoke Spanish and we spoke both at home because my dad didn't really know that much English. Um, and I wish I would have embraced it more as a kid. I, I, I would get embarrassed even if my dad got out of the car and started yelling at me in Spanish at school in front of all my friends. But, um, you know, as you get older, I think you really cherish that. And 
I think Oscar hit on it a little bit, being able to travel to all Latino America, that's still on my bucket list to go to all the countries. Um, I know I got to go to Costa Rica with Oscar, Oscar uh, for school, um, and that was a lot of fun. And they just treat you like family. I think we're all different cultures, like everyone said here, uh, different ways of talking and different food. But uh, when we get together, I feel like it's mi gente. I really feel like it's family. Yeah, that's great, Alejandra. Thank you all for sharing. I I completely agree. And I, even if it's different, you know, dialects, different regions, I think when we come together over like a plate of food and some music playing and really just get to know one another and create those spaces, um, you know, it's a really beautiful thing to see and experience. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit, um, can we, I'm uh, sorry, can you, not me, <laughs> can we, uh, can you briefly describe your academic and professional journeys um, as folks in the Latino community? Um, Three-pronged question here, so I can repeat it, um, but what are some of the challenges and barriers that you faced, and what are the cultural strengths or roots that you leaned on during those experiences to get you through? Go ahead and um, start this one off. I think, um, being first gen, coming back from, um, coming from Mexican parents who, you know, immigrated, I think financial barriers is the first thing that comes to mind, right? Um, and I am the oldest of my siblings. So there was a lot of that responsibility, a lot of, I was parentified a lot. So um, just considering higher education at one point wasn't even an option, right? I remember, um, <clears throat> I remember graduating high school and then going to community college and kind of still not knowing what I wanted to do, but knowing that I didn't want to do what my parents were doing. My dad always said, it's better to work with your mind than to work with your hands and your back. And so that's something that always stood out to me. And so um, I remember at one point I was taking too long and I remember my dad pulling me to the side and saying, what are you doing? ¿Qué estás haciendo? ¿Estás gastando el tiempo? ¿Por qué no nomás te pones a trabajar? Um, and so then that kind of really stood out to me because I felt like there was already barriers, but then having that pressure from my parents or my dad and specifically um, added to it. And so I think um, just navigating also academia by myself and learning, having to learn, having to miss out on opportunities because I didn't know ahead of time or because nobody was there to tell me about it. And so I had to you know, navigate those as well. But I think at the end of the day, I, I fell back on that resiliency that our community shows all time after time. And so I just continued and I continued and, and thankfully I was able to, to thrive in, in the academia institutions, which is, which is difficult and which a lot of times you feel like you, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know if you're doing it right. You're just hoping for the best, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that's, um, resiliency is definitely one of the things that allowed me to, um, to finish and pursue my education. Thank you, Jessica. Anybody would like to keep I think to piggyback off Jessica, I think there was also like a knowledge gap in terms of what it meant to go to a, like what was the difference between a Cal State, a UC, a private, you know, they understood that there were universities and colleges and JCs, but that was the extent of it. So having to navigate applications and, and what an SAT test or what an AP exam meant, um, was very uh, me having to become my own knowledge bank in that sense, or my own researcher. And um, I was very fortunate that I had really great college counselors and guidance counselors during my high school time who, who helped me guide through things like FAFSA and things like that. But there was also this element of trust that was bestowed on me from my parents. They're like, you know what? You understand it better than we do. We'll trust you with whatever process that you decide or whatever major or whatever school that you decide to go to. Um, we'll figure it out, you know, um, when it happens, but we trust that you're going to make the right decision. And I think like, as I got older in the process that I've kind of created for myself, I remember at one point after my master's, I went to teach abroad in South Korea. And I remember telling my parents like, hey, I'm going to do this because this is happening. And they're like, it, it kind of came back to that point where it was like, you know what, we trust you and your process. So just go do what you need to do because it's working for you so far. Um, so there, there was this piece that um, that I was kind of the knowledge bank for my route and my path that I was going to do academically. Nice, thank you, Oscar. I'll dovetail off of that. I think uh, in general, knowledge knowledge gaps and everything, right? I was first generation born here. My family didn't speak English. They couldn't read English. Um, 
were Im immigrants, some still are. Uh, and in general, for me, it was friendships and just being vulnerable. A lot of I don't knows <laughs> and just um, and it's it's embarrassing. You're shy. You don't want to say it. But I, I think friendships really put me through and some mentors. So just friendships, mentorship and, and really just being vulnerable and coming out. I don't know what that means, even the most basic things. Uh, you know, and I, I just always remember that they've, I've always received help and my friends and coaches and teachers and, and everybody else that I met along, you know, personally, professionally and academic, just being vulnerable. Um, and I thank them every day for their patience with me because it took a lot for me to learn <laughs> in certain different areas. Uh, but just being vulnerable and really leaning on, on others really helped me. So for me, it was, I remember when I got to the fourth grade and my parents said, well, we don't speak English, so good luck. You're now going to be doing no more Spanish classes. And so it's that given me that agency of like, good luck, we're rooting for you. But then having good teachers and, you know, counselors that were like, Manny, you're going to go to college. And then just hearing that, right. But also just uh, my parents from a very young age, they would talk about just their hardships and why we, I needed to find a job that was in an office setting, not working in a factory. And so having that sort of way on me that I was like the their hope for the future to, you know, break generational curses. And so that also made me ask questions and seek, um, like he said, be vulnerable, but let my teachers know, like, y'all are my, you are where I'm getting my social capital from because my parents don't know how to navigate that. And so I was very fortunate in that sense, but I just remember being told on fourth grade, like, all right, you're on your own, figure it out. Yeah. I would, um, my, my narrative is, um, so I'm first generation and I'm the first one to go to college. So it was a, a lot of firsts, right? So, um, kind of like what James and everyone else was saying. It's like, they believe in you. And at the same time, you have like this kind of imaginary, um, like you're carrying something because you're first, the first one. So it's like, you can't, you can't let us down, right? It's like, we came all the way here. We're doing this, we're working hard. It's like, you gotta, you gotta do it. And now that I'm in a doctoral program, it's like, um, at the same time, they're kind of like, you're still in school? You're still, you're still doing it? Why are you, why are you doing this, right? So, and, and sometimes I even question myself, I'm like, why am I doing this, right? Um, I, have a, I have a job, I, you know, it's not like, but at the same time, I can see that there's not a lot of representation as a Latina, uh, woman in in higher ed in uh, doctoral programs um, so I think I'm in the right spot but at the same time it, it's it can get uh, difficult to to get that support sometimes because you do have support but sometimes your family thinks that you're like why are you why are you still doing this so yeah yeah and I just wanted to touch on what Manny and Anna shared. It was relatable to me of like, Manny, I know you're talking about when you were a kid, um, like being in fourth grade. I remember being in elementary school and telling myself the same thing. Like, you need to go to college. Uh, my parents didn't finish college. They had four kids together, uh, but I'm the middle child of six. And we were just really poor, you know, grew up like no furniture, electricity goes out whenever, uh, trying to figure out where you're going to live. Um, and so it's a lot of pressure, especially like you guys were saying, right, especially if we're bilingual, especially if we were born in the U.S., uh, our parents, uh, not purposely, right, but they put a lot of pressure on us. They want us to succeed, uh, finish school if they weren't able to um, and be successful. Um, and so I think some of the barriers, like you guys said, not knowing fully, like, how can I get financial resources to go to a good college, to go to school, um, and even in your career, um, Anna, I think you were touching on this, uh, Dr. G or Dr. Miramonte, she talks about imposter syndrome and it kicks in, you know, like sometimes I want to give up on my dissertation or the program because um, you're like, is this really going to help me? Is this going to get me to where I need to be? Um, and even in the industry where I am, like you said, just the lack of representation and sometimes even have to, to go to my superiors and say like, hey, you didn't pay me for all the hours I put in. Uh, you haven't paid me my commission. Having to do that still in your career, it's a little frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see some comments in there that's been, been really resonating with folks and, you know, I, I completely agree as well. Um, 
We're going to move on to our next question here, um, kind of going on the same topic of, of resiliency and, and strength. And so what lessons um, have you all learned or can be learned from the resiliency and strength demonstrated by you all, your community members, your family members during um, you know, tough times and crises? Yes, I was thinking like when I saw that question, I was thinking of my own family that just inspires me, you know, their whole assimilation process into another country, assimilating to different economic systems, different laws, different languages, um, and all of that. And even though it wasn't formal school, like life was school in a lot of ways, and then having seeing them also go through their own citizenship process later on as well was also really inspiring. So I think I just saw their resilience to keep going and then create a life for themselves where they're now, my parents are now retired um, and are able to, to kind of reap the benefits of like their children did well, they educated their children, they they did all that. So I think there was a lot of strength that came off of even, un, you know, even if they don't, they, they, we didn't notice it at the time. Um, it was definitely very inspiring them. Even like, I remember my mom sitting down and doing her flashcards for her citizenship test um, and having us all quiz her on different things um, was really inspiring to, to kind of just make it all worth it too, you know, in that sense that their journey, that their, their stories and all of that, you know, you want to make sure that they see the fruits of their labor and, um, and just, yeah, it's, it's very inspiring to, to think of when I look back at that time as a kid and watching them just having to figure it out too in their own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, it's two, two, two short ones. It's uh, never quit and be creative. I, I, I don't think I ever saw any of my family, member, family members ever quit. They worked so hard. And when one door closed, they opened another one. And I mean, we worked very, very hard. We were very, very poor. Uh, I used to work at the swap meet at a very young age so I can buy my own uniforms once the uniforms was needed. And uh, they never stopped working um, and they never they never quit and they're super creative. And, you know, I, I think you guys probably all resonate with this. And but even going in like we need money, we'll go get and sell tamales and they'll just go sell tamales on the corner of the street. And, you know, they'll go around to family and friends and they're just resilient. They were just, you know, creative and they, they always figured it out and they always made sure that there was food on the table, roof over the head. And yes, we, we didn't have furniture and all the other things that we had, but at minimum, we always had food and we always had a roof and we always had a home. So that to me is just always work hard, never quit and be creative. When one door closes, open another one. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Oliva, I wrote that down myself. I literally wrote down, never give up, keep pushing forward. Like exactly what you all said. I, I think we've all witnessed it in our families and our communities, just our parents working so hard. Uh, mine haven't been able to retire yet, but I'm hoping to get them there, uh, like all Scott's family. Um, and I was thinking of, I don't know if you guys know The Rock. I love him. He used to be a wrestler and he's like a superstar now, but he always says blood, sweat, respect, and hardest worker in the room. And like, honestly, I think that of our community and it re resonates a lot with the AAPI uh, culture and other communities as well, just working hard. For me, it would be, um, it would be hustle. So I think anyone that knows me, knows me, knows that I'm a hustler. Um, something that I learned from my family, you know, it's like, um, especially coming from El Salvador um, during the Civil War, there's a lot of, um, a lot of families became matriarchies, a lot of families uh, were broken, um, single families. Um, so I see that within my Mexican brothers and sisters, it's a lot like a lot of community, a lot of like big families, but in the Salvadorian community, um, a lot of that, um, fell apart because of the civil war right so so hustler my mom my grandmother was a hustler she had like three jobs um but she always sent the kids well fed and and they had clothes and you know they had a, a roof um over their head so that's what I learned from them and I would say also humility I think that um it's really important that we see everybody, that we value everybody the same equitably um, from people, you know, because we all have parents who are janitors, we have parents who like uh, cleaned houses, we have parents who like did all these, all these things, right, that, that help a society move forward. And sometimes they're not um, seen or valued as others. So um, that's something that I was taught to, to do in my family.
Well, for me, I would say um, early on being aware of said the word sacrifice and what that meant. I was constantly told we we gave up our homeland to come here. So that that always being aware of that, right? And just knowing that, man, like I've got to work harder. I've got to have that grit. Like my parents sacrificed leaving everything they knew. So it kind of like, it's my turn to, you know, push that forward. And even when it came to sharing meals, right? Maybe we didn't always eat out, but man, we could sure squeeze those beans for a whole week. Again, sacrifice, right? That whole idea, we're doing the sacrifice, but it'll be worth the, the compensation. So, yeah. I add, um, I think like everybody has mentioned hustle, working hard, right? Sacrifice, like Manny just mentioned. But I think also something that stood out to me growing up aside of just working, working was faith, right? I don't know if you guys saw this at home, but no matter how hard things got, how bad they got, it was, it's always going to be okay. It's going to be fine. And a lot of times there was comparisons of like, oh, there's other people who have it worse. Oh, at least we have a meal on the table. At least we have a roof over our head. Um, and so just also just knowing that, that whatever we did have, be grateful for. And so that kind of also impacted just the way we went through adversity and through crisis because we also said, it's gonna, it's good. Yeah, somebody put, we'll figure it out. And yeah, we always would and we always have. And I think that's something very important in our community. And I think that's one of our strengths that we always figure it out. Like James was, I think James was the one that shared about the tamales, right? Like there's no stopping us. Like if we're stuck in, in a position in our lives, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll find how to get out of there. It'll be tough and it'll be hard, but we'll make it out no matter what. Yeah, yeah I love that. Thank you. That's what Walt said, Jessica. Um, and I, I resonate with everything <laughs> everyone said. I want to add in, you know, the phrase you know, I've heard all my life and I'm sure I'm sure you all have heard too is, you know, ponte las pilas. And it's kind of just kind of like that reminder that would ring in, you know, in my head of like, OK, no, you you can't catch yourself slipping and you have to keep moving. Um, and so all these like models and, and phrases, you know, that just kind of at the end of the day, we're in the background and kind of, uh, you know, the soundtrack <laughs> to our mental thoughts, you know? Um, but yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for sharing. Um, our next question is, what role uh, does cultural heritage, cultural wealth uh, play in empowering uh, Latino students and professionals? Um, and the follow-up to that is what can colleges, universities, uh, and workspaces do to better support their uh, Latino population? And I'll put that in the chat uh, right now as well. I think it's fine for, for the, the second part of that. Um, how can they support us and how can they bring us out is getting us to write down our lessons learned like we just had. I think we all have beautiful stories. Uh, mm -hmm. and seeing that resilience and seeing that mental toughness and everything that we just all mentioned is how do you take all those lessons learned highlight them and then teach them and teach it right it, it's all these behaviors that we have very resilient um, I think that's something that we can share with the world um, and we can learn from other cultures it's not just you know Latinos I've seen other cultures that have the same level of resilience right and mental toughness and at least we're alive at least we have a meal and today is today and tomorrow will be tomorrow and tomorrow will try even harder. Um, and nowadays where people need more resilience, right? I think more than ever, they need to learn how to be resilient now. Everything's changing on a daily basis. Um, I think they can learn from us and how resilient we are and how our family immigrated here and they were successful and they and we were successful. I just don't think that it's, I've, I've never seen it, you know, where it's captured and communicated and we capitalize on those lessons learned and then we help others with it as, as much as we, we would all like, right? I see a little bit of it, but I think there needs to be a lot more of it. And that's why I enjoy and I enjoy these sessions and I participate in them because anytime I can share my story within my safe community, I do. Uh, so that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leo. Anyone else want to want to tackle the question? Yeah, I think in terms of what colleges could do, I think of outreach just being a big thing. Um, you know, for all of us, I've done graduate work. You know, we're we're kind of embedded in this Pepperdine community piece, but a Pepperdine could be really intimidating to a first gen family because it's it's like another planet. You know, um, big buildings. You know, you're thinking about like 
like the Malibu campus and all of these pieces. And I was thinking like outreach is, is the best way because sometimes it's not feasible and a lot of people don't want to leave their comfort zones either or to know that, hey, there's people that share your story or that you have common threads with who have gone through this already and have achieved these things. So I think that there needs to be something for first gen family. I think that's a big thing is it, just going to be outreach to these families because they wouldn't know how to approach a school otherwise, right? So it would be to have an active program for either how to finance the schools, how to apply to the schools, you know, and all of those pieces, how to succeed in the schools as well. How do you seek out mentorship as well? Um, I think would be key factors to support um, the Latino community. Definitely. I think kind of going off what Oscar was saying, I think also giving the mic to the community and actually trying to find out what it is that we need, what are our barriers and not just giving the mic, but also listening um, and not assuming that because we're Latinos, this is what we need or this is what we must be struggling with. Um, and I know sometimes our challenges and barriers can be unique, but then those, those supports should be unique as well. And they should be tailored to, to be able to assist us um, so that we can navigate these institutions that can get very intimidating from time to time. Um, because I, I, especially nowadays, I hear a lot about like, oh, cultural diverse, diversity and, and cultural humility and DEI. And all I see is this talk, but I don't see the walk. And so I think it goes back to that, just really actually listening to what the needs are and actually doing something about it instead of just assuming that this is what we need. I would say in terms of this cultural wealth, you know, you just learn early on to be a hard worker. And so we take that into the university college space. We, we endure, we may not know how we're going to get that degree, but we're going to just figure it out, either find that resource or have those late nights studying while you're trying to balance work. But then in you, the working spaces, I would say is, or even in college, being afforded opportunities for many students, Latino students, it comes down to money, right? And so these universities have endowments, like let's put that money really where our mouth is and really support these kids and create equitable opportunities, have those kids that are trying to work, but maybe we can give them an extra scholarship to pay for their room and board. I think many times it's like, we do a good job of just getting them there, but not fully supporting and understanding that we have to get, afford those opportunities or else people are gonna fall through the cracks because we see that time and time again. And in the workspaces, I would say we're hard workers, but create those opportunities, right? To give us mentorship or find us sponsors who are going to say that's a hard worker. We need to move him and put him in, you know, different workshops or we need to elevate him and, uh, you know, promote him instead of giving us extra work because they see our hard work and they we're, we're making up for those other employees that are not hard workers. Yeah. Alejandra? Yeah, I would add um, kind of like what Manny's saying. Um, I think we're taught to work hard, but we're not taught sometimes to work smart. So sometimes that's hard for us. Sometimes uh, we don't even value our own worth in the workspace because we, 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 you know, we have to prove something or, or we have to meet expectations or, you know. Um, so I think that that's important. Um, I think it was until graduate, I think I was in the, my doctoral program, I heard the fir for the first time sponsorship. And that is kind of sad because it's really important, it's really valuable, and it can be something so useful for, for us. And I think that colleges were doing a really great job um, helping students, like undergraduate students with financial aid, but also those doctoral programs, also those graduate programs, those master programs, right? Like it can get really pricey. Sometimes we want to go to those beautiful conferences and present and be part of that community, but you have to talk about the membership. You got to work about um, how the hotels and, and, and all these expenses, right? So um, build that, that financial aid for equitably throughout. So so we don't get stuck somewhere in the middle. Um, 
Yeah, and I just wanted to add on like all the experiences shared here, I feel the same way. Um, I just feel that it's colleges, universities, workplaces that can open space for us to express ourselves just like now, you know, whether that takes focus groups. Um, and I love that Manny said mentorships. I was just thinking that I, I would love to see more managers, more leaders who look like me uh, and want to help me get to that position as well. But I think it really just goes back to empathy, uh, like you all were saying, listening and actually taking action. So it's not just a DEIB policy that we see in a manual, but really uh, allowing that space for different cultures and traditions to flourish. Yeah, thank you all. And I completely uh, resonate with everything that I said. I also wanna point out uh, Dr. Mia Montes's uh, comment there in the chat that they can pay us what we're worth. And I 100% retweet that, plaster that everywhere. I think, um, you know, going off of you know holding institutions accountable you know that's part of the action right that's part of what they can do it's the first step right and making sure that you know we're um being paid for all the hard work that we do right um so i would like to have that on a t-shirt somewhere and just have it everywhere <laughs> um moving on we have our uh next question is how um kind of going off of you know empathy and listening is how can we better recognize and celebrate the diverse cultures and traditions within the Latino community, while still fostering a sense of um, unity. And as you all have mentioned, coming from different um, communities, different regions within Latino America. I think just holding more events like this, right? I think uh, Oscar said it well, it's outreach, is continuing to hold more events. This is just a start and continuing to just draw a bigger crowd and get more awareness. Uh, I think it's just, I think that's the main thing, right? I think if we didn't have this space, I wouldn't be here. And someone created this space. I don't know who did, but thank you for creating this space. And every time I see it, I jump into action and I participate. And it starts with creating that space with outreach and awareness. Once we have that space, and then I think everybody will come out and support it and, and we can have more celebration of who we are. I think too, um, to piggyback off what James says, is also celebrating the cultures you're not in as well, right? Um, we can't have solidarity within our own community if we don't have solidarity within other communities and celebrate them. So it was so happy to look at the audience and see different classmates and different faculty here from all different walks of life as well. And just, you know, even if schools, um, I've seen it in my own school through the genesis of our affinity groups too, where the students really celebrate all the BSU events, all the LASSO events, all the MENA events and the Asian Pacific Islander events um, has been great because I think that's how you also create a sense of self too is through osmosis and, and, and seeing others celebrate, celebrate their rich cultures as well. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Austin. I would add um, growing up in the eighties and the nineties, it was, the culture was a lot about assimilating, a lot about fitting in, a lot about being American, right? And looking like people on TV. Um, and now it's it's a lot of more empowering. I see this in the classroom. I see this with students, with younger students, you know, and like kind of what James was saying, we grow into loving and having pride of where we come from, but having that at a at a young age and grow into it would be is is amazing right so i think that that's things like these um really elevate um what's happening in culture uh culturally right now um amongst uh, our communities thank you I also wanted to add, I think, a big piece is networking. Um, and I think that's on our community as well as others, right? Uh, so joining in those professional communities where we want to be a part of, even if we're the only one, I think not being scared to be the only one there. Um, and then uh, personally, like on LinkedIn, I've looked at more too, where I could join, where it was Latinx and Latina specifically. So there was like a Latinx and sports community that I've joined. Uh, Latinas that are professional as well. Um, and like I mentioned to you guys, I used to work with Latinx students who wanted to get their MBA. So a really good uh, foundation is called Prospanica. Um, and they're actually for Hispanic Latinx uh, MBA holders and business professionals. Um, and they hold conferences too, like this month, they're gonna be in Vegas. So I think really building our network um, and getting out there, getting our face seen um, and building these other communities uh, to really help us advance as well. 
Thank you. Any, anyone else? Really? Jessica, Manny. Stay, find ways to bring people together. We talk about unity. What unites us? Food. You know, <laughs> find those ways, you know, or I just, you know, sometimes I'll find music, right? I'll find mariachi music that's playing an English cover for my students. And they're like, wow, I've never heard a Taylor Swift song in a mariachi style, right? And so it's, that's how we're uniting people. So well, that's how beautiful it sounds in my culture and we can all come together. So that's what I, I try to find those connecting points. Awesome. Yeah, and kind of adding to Manny, I know I mentioned in my introduction that I uh, co-founded an organization, a student body organization, and I think um, how we are creating that sense of unity is um, through our co different cultures and acknowledging them and bringing them together and highlighting them all. Um, I think um, a lot of times Mexicans try to take over, right? I'm Mexican myself, and it's a lot of Mexican this and Mexican that. But there's a lot more than just Mexican, right? And so just highlighting all of those cultures and just learning from one another and creating that sense of community because, I mean, although we may be from Puerto Rico, from Cuba, from Argentina, from Salvador, Guatemala, we all have similarities, even though we may have a lot of differences. And I think those similarities a lot of times is what brings that sense of unity, right? And so just, um, and also like someone mentioned, spaces like this where we can talk and share and relate to one another. I think that's very important because a lot of times we, we might not be able to share our stories or a lot of times we might not be able to relate to folks. Um, but yeah. Yeah, thank you everybody. Um, I, uh, our next question kind of divvied or, or was leading into that. So you all talked about it a little bit um, already. But um, it, it goes, how can we promote cross-cultural understanding and collaboration between the Latino community and other cultural groups uh, here in the States, outside of the States? Um, there's a follow-up to that as well as what has that looked like for you inside and outside of the classroom? Um, so you all have touched on it um, a little bit, um, but if there's some other insights you all want to share, feel free um, and jump on in. So for me, it's been through storytelling. Uh, sometimes, you know, when I'm in spaces and I hear from my other students who come from other countries and finding that connection of, oh, you know, like having to leave a, a war zone area, right? And then I get to talk about sort of the struggles my parents had and why they left their country, that in itself. So storytelling is so powerful because for many people, that's all that's left that we can hang on to write those stories, but that they truly mark us and they're kind of the, the, the foundation of why we are who we are today. So that's that the work for, for the spaces I've been in. I think that's a really central tenet, right? To, to Latino culture and our community, right? Is being able to tell stories and through different ways, whether that's through music, you know, verbally and like over cafe and pan with your elders, with your family, with your friends, right? Um, so I think it's it's one of those really big important pieces of what what makes us us. I think we touched on this um, before on in other questions about that aspect of vulnerability, and I think because the older you get, you know, the less embarrassed or shy you might be. So you know, I I start meeting people and it's like we're so much more alike than we are different and it's just really nice to to recognize similar traditions similar foods right um similar um rituals so um it's pretty awesome to just be vulnerable and open and kind of uh, i think we also talked about listening you know sometimes we're not taught to listen and, and if you listen hard enough, you'll listen that there's like these really big connections and similarities between um, all sorts of cultures. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And I, think, I just uh, wanted, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I was just thinking of an example of when I went to a mall in California and I saw uh, a Muslim community that was sharing information about Islam and sharing information like a short version of the Quran and I walked up to them and I took whatever they were giving and I listened to them and um, I felt that was amazing 
you know, I was just like, wow, it takes a lot of courage for you to sit here and to say, hey, this is my religion. This is who we are. This is, you know, so you can learn a little bit about us. Um, and I haven't seen that much with other cultures. So I, I guess we can challenge ourselves to, can we get a group of us or a group of people and a community to go out to different communities and stand there and say, this is a little bit about the Latino community. And these are some of, you know, some of who we are, where we come from, some of our food, some of our culture, some of our religion, a little bit of everything. Uh, just like it took a lot of courage for that group of people. They pitched the tent right in the middle of the mall and they were just handing out pamphlets. And I walked up to him and I said, wow, that's amazing. The courage that it took for you to do this. And thank you so much for doing it and, and walked away. And I hope that gave them a little bit of inspiration to share more, share more of their culture with us. Um, so I just think of why can't we do the same thing, even though it might be a little, a little embarrassing or, or shy to do that. And I just wanted to add on to that, just working in the sports industry, um, some of our teams here in Colorado, they're doing like Hispanic Heritage Night. Um, and one of my colleagues, she works for the NBA team uh, in our portfolio. So we're bouncing off ideas like having an instructor teach salsa before uh, the game, halftime folklorico or something else. Uh, someone even told her like, what about rum tasting? <laughs> so we have different liquors in different types of Latino America countries too. So I think exposing people to that, right? To the community that's right in your backyard. Some people just don't realize we're so diverse and look at our community. Um, and I think like you guys said, right? Just going beyond giveaways or a promotional night, you know, what else does it mean um, to have a shared cultural and traditions? Um, and then one area I would really like to see um, communities get together is actually mental health and wellness. I know we talked a lot about how we work so hard and sometimes I'll speak for myself. I think our community tolerates a lot um, and we forget about self-care and healthy boundaries. Um, and I know one of my dear friends in my cohort, she's AAPI, we talk about that all the time. So I would love to see communities and different cultures get together about mental health and wellness as well. So to also piggyback off of, I think what Anna, James and Alejandra said was, um, I was the founding faculty moderator for our Latin Hispanic student group on um, at the campus I work at. And I remember one of the things they wanted was just a platform, right, to teach. And I think the way that you create cross-cultural connections is to show that there's really more parallels and there are differences between cultures as well. It was like, oh, like, like there's the 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 Latin version of bingo called Loteria. Like, oh, we have a cha-cha slide too. It's called the Caballo Dorado. And, um, you know, when you see these things and you see these platforms, I think the student body in general sees like, oh, this is, I, I know this, there's something here I know, it's just told different or in another language. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Let me see here. We have a lot of like resonant, folks are really resonating in the chat to say, <laughs> you all know. Um, Jessica, did you have a chance to, to jump in? Didn't, but I think everyone, every I I can resonate with what everybody said. Awesome, awesome. I'll share um a, a tidbit too. I think for for me and in, in my household, we have um our neighbors who are Nigerian and we love them dearly. I used to kind of babysit for their little ones every now and then. And um recently, my mom was like, you know, we haven't hung out with them in a little bit, and she made a carne asada and she brought them all over and. Um, you know, something that wonderful that I, I get to see in those spaces is really how we share with one another too. And they were showing us like music videos and like music from, from their area and like what weddings look like um, for them and like, like their traditional customs and things that like we start to like see that are, um, you know, in connection and parallel with one another. Um, so I also just think about like, how can we do that in our social spaces, right? In our own communities with the folks that we live around in. Yeah. So we're we're at our last question. Um, and it's why do you believe that it is important to celebrate Latino Heritage Month? And you know, how do you celebrate your cultural roots, you know, um outside of this month too? You know, it's not we don't stop being Latino after October 15th, right? So <laughs> uh, you know, I just think about um, so how do you you know celebrate it during the month and and how do you celebrate it outside of the month? I think um, I, I was expressing this to a classmate the other day, and it was about having had immigrant parents and who get older, you get older, they get older, and the family they're rooted in in their home country passes away. It's weird to see those ties be cut 
and happening to you in real time in front of you too. So you need a space like this to, to, to keep those ties present and strong within here, within your home in the US too, so that you can create those ties for your children, your nieces, your nephews, and all of those uh, generations that are up and coming. Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh, really just remembering where we came from, or where our ancestors came from, or our roots, you know, whether you want to learn Spanish or not, just kind of having a sense of that. Um, what's the diversity behind that? And how are we a puzzled piece that completes the US, um, speaking of that. Um, and then I, I just think it exposes us to different cultures. Like all of you shared your stories and we're all from different parts of Latino America or similar ones. And I think it gives me a better understanding and empathy for your communities and where you grew up and how your family dynamics were. Um, so I think it gives us a better sense of appreciation. Yeah. I think it's important for us to continue to celebrate uh, Latino Heritage Month so we can be seen and heard, just simply said. Uh, I think it's very important that we continue to do this and, and grow on this practice and, and get into as many spaces as we can. Um, and also, I think the last question was, how do you celebrate your cultural roots outside of this month? Uh, I like to share like uh, this month or last month, my daughter turned uh, nine years old. So I sang her the Mañanitas and I said, we sing the Mañanitas and we wake you up in the morning and I translated it word for word for her. And I and I sang Vicente Fernandez, Mañanitas, that's my favorite version. Uh, and that's how I share as much as I can with those around me. Uh, I try to impact my close circle as much as I can. And I share as much as our, of, as much as I can about our culture. Uh, and I think it's always well received. I think it's, they love hearing it. Uh, I think they always, they love being engaged in something new. And I think um, that's what helps me with a little bit of my shyness of sharing. Uh, it's I sort of test with my my inner circle and, and they like it. And then I kind of get a little bit of braver and, and share outside. I was going to say, James, between my mom, my sister and my niece, the one thing you cannot get away as a female in my family is from your quinceañera. And, like that's, <laughs> that's a non-negotiable. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, for me, I think what comes to mind, and I know Alejandra mentioned this earlier, mental health and wellness. And so I feel that as for an individual like myself, who identifies very closely with her roots, it's important to celebrate um, our Latino heritage, not only the, you know, this month, but every day. And I know um, there's been um, I mean, if we look back at mental health and um, my experience with older generations, especially those in our countries of origin, there was no, there was really not much depression, not much anxiety, um, at least not disclosed, right? And so if we see that, we see that a lot now with our first gen students and first gen individuals. And I think a lot of that has to do with that disconnection that disconnection from our roots, from our authenticity, from our ancestors, um, and just from all that knowledge that we bring. So that's why I think um, just honoring your heritage, um, not only it, it, it helps your overall mental health and overall how you feel, how you show up, um, and just having that, you know, these spaces allows us to just better understand each other too. Um, so I, I celebrate it. I, I live by it. So I don't think I have to celebrate it every day. I, I, I mean, I eat bread, tortilla with almost all my meals. <laughs> How more Mexican can I get? Um, the mañanitas, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's just my, for me, at least it's just my, my way of life. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. For me, shout out to Viv. She's telling me to, to talk about my restaurant, so. Uh, besides the academia, uh, I have a legacy restaurant. I have a Salvadorian restaurant. And for a long time, kind of like everything else, right? Kind of like just James was saying, you grow into being proud of whatever it is you do um, and who you are. Um, you know, for a really long, I mean, so this thing has been, we've had this restaurant since I was born. We started with a food truck and then my grandmother had this idea, right? And she had like seventh grade education and she opened six restaurants. 
Um, and so I'm third generation with the restaurant. My daughter helps me out with the restaurant. We keep the recipes um, that my grandmother still used. And then sometimes, you know, I'll have like hipsters coming in and learning about our food and I have to teach them about Salvadorian and pupusas and whatnot. But sometimes I get these like these these customers that were my grandmother's customers and they share in those stories like Manny's saying, right? They share. And so like, I feel like the restaurant's more than a restaurant. I feel like it's part of the community. It's part of the history. It's part of my history. It's part of the LA history. Uh, we were one of the first Salvadorian pupuserias around. So um, yeah, that's how I celebrate um, Heritage Month all year long. Wow, that's Which, awesome. I have to give us the name. <laughs> it's called Los Morcajetes. And I could tell you the story of the name because it's Mexican, but I could share that story some other time. Oh, we, we just, here. Go ahead, Manny. Sorry. <laughs> I would just say that it's important to celebrate it because we're here, because we're not going anywhere. And we used to not have this. I mean, I used to remember going to Target. There was never the Hispanic Month Heritage Book Collection or the fashion line. And so I think this is important because it gives you a sense of pride and it acknowledges that we're here and that we are part of this fabric of this country and the diversity. And, you know, especially I think about in the 90s where sometimes we were just trying to assimilate and it was almost like your culture was something that you did at home it didn't go out in the streets um you know i just went to the rebelde concert here in dallas last week and i put on my facebook and all these friends asking me what is rbb and it's like let me school you like here's a here's their english album right and so i think that's why this is important and i think i celebrate it every day because I work in education and I'm boots on the ground. And especially because with, in Texas, you know, Greg Abbott wanting to remove diversity, equity, and inclusion from the language. Well, then I am now that walking diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I feel that I, it's just that nonverbal, right? When my students see me, their parents see me and just that relief of, yes, I'm here and we're not going anywhere. Thank you, Manny. That was really powerful as well. Anyone else think we're all good? Everybody's had a chance to go. Yeah, cool. Um, also, I'm I'm also going to that Rebelde concert in about two weeks, so I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> that's gonna be a good time. Um, so I we're well, that's that's it for our questions for our panelists, at least for the ones that we've prepared. And I we do want to give the last 15 minutes of tonight to be able to answer questions for folks who are in the audience tonight. Um, so I we do have a question here from Anna. Um, with the growth of Latino demo, uh, dem demography, sometimes that word stumps me, 23% um, of US population, how do you see the advancement of Latino leadership in your own community or in public service and policy making? And I can drop that in the chat as well for our folks who are visuals. I know I'm a big visual learner and I need to see it. <laughs> I can jump in. Um, I think this was Aaliyah's question or one from the crowd, uh, audience, but um, one of my friends, she was actually in here right now and uh, I think she had to leave, but we did some work in one of our classes in, in public policy class actually for DACA students. Um, so that's a project we want to work on, um, like making a podcast and really advocating for that. I'm sure you guys are seeing what's going on in the courts right now. You know, will they be given pathway to citizenship? Is it going to be revoked and all of that? Um, but earlier I also talked about how Oscar was on a trip with me with GSCP, we went to Costa Rica and we met children there too. And uh, I was surprised they were, you know, like third to fifth grade and only learning English maybe three times a week. Um, and I think that's a passion of mine that I wanna do in Latino America is like visit all the countries, like I said, but really kind of help with the curriculum and policy for students to learn English as a second language because it will help them uh, everywhere in the world. And also to keep, uh, following STEAM type of careers, because um, I don't think we see enough of Latinos, Latinx, Hispanic X in STEM careers, um, and I would love to advocate for that in those countries. Hmm. Yeah. 
Thank you, Alejandra. Anyone else want to want to tackle the question? I would just say in my community, we're, there's still a lack of representation, especially here in Fort Worth. Um, for whatever reason, either people do not make it far enough in their education to be able to get as engaged politically in their community, or sometimes, like I tell people, we're not taught advocacy in the power in words and in a vote. And so a lot of times it's educating people, but it, it's hard, right? We're living in a time where people are just trying to survive. So sometimes people don't understand that if we don't get people that look like us in our community to do public, public service and policy making, we're going to continue having people that don't look like us make the rules and the policies. And that's what's going on, especially here in Texas. I think, too, the last several years have been very politically delicate as well is also for communities that may not have access to certain information is to make sure to dispel misinformation for them as well. I think there's a lot of things that I think, especially immigrant families who may not know certain things will take at face value. And so I think there's there's things to, to like I said before, like there, there needs to be an outreach piece, I think that I could see in order to, to have your voice be represented or anything like that. Um, I think dispelling a lot of information is going to be really important in knowing how do you check for validity of things that you're reading on Facebook, on social media and all of that. I think I would resonate with uh, what Alejandra I think mentioned and just going into spaces that you are uncomfortable being, you know, a lot of times, and we talk about these in our courses, when we are applying somewhere, you know, we have to fit everything, you know, all the bullets, we gotta like, it's gotta be it. And if not, we don't meet a certain criteria, we don't go for it. So um, just being brave enough to, to enter these spaces where, like Manny said, representation is needed is, um, is very important. Um, yeah. Thank you, Anna. Dr. Oliva, I see your your mic. I just wanted to check in. No, I just want, yeah, I just was. I think I what Oscar said and what everybody's been saying. I think education is huge for our community. Um, like what I said, uh, for my family growing up, we were very ignorant because we we came from a whole completely different country, and I don't think some of these opportunities were available in those countries, and they also didn't participate in you know policy making or in public service in in those countries. At least not my family. So then under they they always just accept the situation. They always accept what's given to them. And like Alejandra said, we're very tolerant. We have very high tolerance. Um, and we're very humble and we're very um just acceptance of everything of our the situation that's given to us and we don't we don't push back. I think that's something I learned from from my family and and in general is we we don't push back enough. And I think here if we can educate the community a little bit better and what this means for us and how it can be better for us um, and bringing everybody together uh, and then helping them maybe even with the pathway to citizenship so their vote can count um, and different things it's just there, there's so much work to be done there um, so more education more awareness uh, more efforts to to get people uh, to understand that we we can make a difference yeah very well said Dr. Olivia. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat, but I do want to invite uh, folks in the audience. Um, if you have a question, feel free uh, raise your hand. Use the raise your hand feature here on Zoom, or if you want to put it in the chat, feel free to do so as well. We do have uh, still a couple of minutes, so um, feel free to ask away. Okay, so I know I said I wasn't going to ask questions, but I might have to ask a question. Actually, Stephen has his hand up. Look, he saved you all. So I'll defer to Stephen, given the time. Thank you, Dr. Miramontes. No, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, um, for being here, for taking the time. Um, Oscar, I I resonate with what you said when you said Pepperdine, you know, could be a little intimidating. Um, I definitely had those feelings, you know, going into the program. Uh you know, it does kind of give off those vibes, but, you know, from the start, the orientation, um, Dr. Miyaki Trap, you know, just the whole sense of belonging um, provided that comfort. And then just being here, you know, seeing you guys. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. 
And then I think um, after my first face to face session, you know, just that whole, you know, like I can do it, you know, like, so I just after that, I texted my cousin, you know, he's in high school right now. And I just kind of shared him that message like, hey, man, like you can do it. You know, whatever it is that you put your mind to it, you can do it. Don't ever let no one say that you can't. So um, I just want to say thank you for, you know, providing that assurance. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> I'm not sure if our panelists, you know, I don't know if y'all want to chime in or give a quick response, but feel free. Are you first year, Stephen? Yes. So this is my first year. Um, I'm coming from a, a first generation family business. Um, this was a part of my strategic development. Um, and just, you know, seeing this community, getting these emails, um, you know, being the the Latino male in my family. And, you know, everyone says, you know, go to school, get your education, but they don't really say how to, you know, so just kind of, you know, having this, not really the roadmap, but having these doors open for me and, you know, having these connections, you know, it just, it makes me feel like my decision, that strategic choice was, was, you know, on point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're happy to have you, Stephen, as well. <laughs> Thank happy you so much. Here. I was just gonna say, oh, I was just gonna say to Stephen, like, uh, don't be afraid to lean on your colleagues and have a support group, even at school, outside of school. Like, I couldn't have done it without my cohort, honestly. And I, I know I said this earlier. Like, there's so many times I wanted to give up on my dissertation. I even thought about not even going into the program right before we started orientation. It is scary, especially if you're the first one in your family to do something. Um, and we're all, I, I, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but like, I think we're all available here. Of, you know, we'd love to be mentors to you. Like, feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any encouragement or motivation, we're here. Awesome, thank you so much. I know having my first presentation this weekend, or this past face-to-face, -face, my heart was just like coming out of my chest, but you know, getting up there and, you know, seeing everybody and just feeling that calmness, it, it feels good. And just hearing that, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I'm definitely going to take advantage if you all don't mind. Yeah, kind of <laughs> piggybacking from Alejandra. Um, I feel like quitting every day. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I can't, I can't do it, right? Like, you got so many things you haven't, you're, you're an adult, right? And you're like, this is crazy. What am I doing? And I'm, I'm going to be like in debt forever. Um, but for sure, the cohort, like your cohort is, is like your support, your best support system. And I have like tons of people that are behind me and they're, they're not letting me give up and, and the professors too. It's a, it's a really great um, community. And I even like, I've met second year, third years that like are, you know, are in this with me too. So so Stephen, yeah, we're all here for you. And and I think too, it was funny, um, just to echo what they're saying too. It's like, I, there's several of my cohort friends in the audience. And when I saw their faces, I was like, ah, like like my, my, my other family is here, like really nice, you know, uh, leading you on. But I think it's really interesting too. I remember by, um, by chance, by happen circumstance, we were, my family was taking a trip, uh, a vacation together and we, had a house that we were staying in and I remember that's when around the time I had decided I had gotten into Pepperdine I had just decided to go back to school I'm like well I have you all in the living room let me tell you about this big decision and commitment that I'm making uh to go back to school and I think just being transparent with them sometimes that it was like sometimes I won't be able to make it to things because I have like this year like chapters of my dissertation do right Dr. Gabby and uh <laughs> but uh but that there are realities and again because they don't know that part of a journey in education as well, you know, they're relying on me to also learn about it, you know, through me as well, and in a way living uh, vicariously as well through me. Absolutely. And I think when someone said, um, you know, why, when we tell them, like, we're going to do this, and they're like, why, 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 you know, it really gets me questioning, like, oh, man, am I really doing something wrong? But then I start to think, like, no, it's like, not why, but it's like, what, what can it do for me, but like, what I could do for it. So I think, you know, just showing up and, you know, being a part of my community, that's that's a huge part of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we have a couple minutes left and we have one more question from Ricardo. Uh, what is your opinion of K through 12 education in the U.S.? Is the perception of MLE education one that just tolerates our students?
I think he put it in the chat so everyone could see. Let me know if you all want me to re, um, re put it in the chat so that it's up in the center. What what does that MLE stand for? Multilingual education. Got it. That's my understanding of it. Yeah. I would say there's still like a lot of systemic barriers um, that we have to overcome, but that we're definitely more aware of. Um, I would say that um, multilingualism is still something that has to be worked on. Um, you have to go looking for these bilingual schools, right? You gotta be go looking for these multilingual schools for these dual language um, immersion schools. So it'd be nice to just, you know, have them more accessible to everybody. So I think that's something that we're still striving for in the K through 12 educational system. Um, but for sure, um, there's a lot of social issue, uh, social justice um, reforms that are happening. Um, I think that, that we're moving forward just slowly. I don't know, I think many words at schools too, right? Yeah, so just to add that, I think obviously we need more culturally responsive teaching approaches, mm -hmm. but more than that, uh, we need better job at recruiting like male Latino teachers in these classrooms, uh, pay them well, you know, recruit them, bring them on board, or for those that are already professionals, help them get their teacher certification credentials. Um, and that's what we're lacking. I mean, in a lot of the schools that I work, the teachers are predominantly still white, and so they don't resemble their students. And so as much as you can create a professional development um, to teach these culturally responsive teaching uh, mechanisms, there's something to be said when you have a teacher that just gets your culture without having to explain it. Also, maybe teacher retention. I think we have to work on re teacher retention because mm -hmm. a lot of times in a lot of our urban schools, we have teachers who stay one or two years, don't get to know the students really well. But to have that foundation, those those teachers that are there for, for a really long time and get to know the needs of the community and of the students um, is also very important. I think, too, there's... Um... It's one view of like what makes poor people look poor and rich people look richer speaking two languages, right? So there's this like stick, like social stigma that also needs to, that you're also fighting against along with everything you said with teacher retention and having people who look like them in the classroom. Wow, anyone else? I think yeah, we're, I'll just yeah. echo what everybody said and, and Manny 100% I think what you just said is that someone doesn't have to try to just inherently get you and they understand and that is you know just just an amazing statement that you just made that hit me really really strongly right now is that that is so much uh, there's so much in that statement right that you you in, inherently just understand the entire culture and you understand everything and all the maybe all the issues and all the barriers and all the problems and then you immediately want to help and you want to be a positive force there whereas if you don't understand all that you're still disoriented and you don't know how to help even though if you have good intentions and, and you know that there's confusion there so beautiful statement yeah yeah, yeah. well we're, we're over um a minute here and um i do I want to respect everybody's time. Um, so I'd like to thank you know our panelists for joining us here tonight for your insight, for your knowledge, and for sharing space with us. I'd like to thank all of our folks in the audience uh, for being here and creating community with us tonight. Big shout out to Elias who's uh, supporting us here from our virtual initiatives team. Uh, thank you to Dr. Ghazi as well, Dr. Mira Montes. Um, again, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we like uh, Dr. Gazi mentioned earlier. This is one of two panels that is um, th that we're hosting, and we're hosting our second one next Tuesday at the same time, and we'll be uh, sending out information for that as well. So, thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. We'll see you all next Tuesday, five thirty p.m. Pacific. <laughs>